Okay, good morning. Uh, I guess we already have a nice crowd here. Thanks for joining Cardiac Sciences Grand Rounds. Uh, actually, today is our last uh, official rounds of this 2020, which was an interesting year, but I got to say we had some fantastic speakers virtually and uh, nothing better than closing with one of our own, Dr. Nirenberg. And Dr. Nirenberg is an Associate Professor and Clinician Scientist here at the University of Calgary. And uh, she has been done a lot of work uh, recently. She has a chair in women's uh, health. And in addition, she's been quite accomplished. She obtained her medical degree from McMaster University. She did her internal medicine training at the University of Alberta, and then spent another year at McMaster where she also received uh, and got a master's in health research uh, methodology. And she's been leading uh, some uh, networks here from Calgary, which I believe she's going to give us some uh, talk on that. For some reason, I don't know what happened to your, are you sharing the screen there? I, I was, is it not working? No. It looked kind of funny, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> why don't you try? Yeah, well, I just finished uh, introducing you. So she's had uh, several publications, over 50 in the last uh, couple of years. Yeah, now that looks great. And she is going to give us a great talk on the relationship between pregnancy and future cardiovascular health. And thanks, uh, Dr. Nirenberg, for agreeing to present at our cardiac rounds. Oh, you're welcome. Well, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, it's really exciting to be able to share some of the results on behalf of our research team, many of whom who are on today's call today. Um, so I just did thought I would start with some disclosures. I don't have any uh, financial disclosures or conflicts of interest. I will disclose that my son may come trying to burst in here on his way to school, which usually happens. Um, but, but I really should acknowledge that the traditional uh, territories that I'm a visitor on um, and posted there the University of Calgary um, recognition of that there. Uh, in terms of the objectives for today's talk, uh, you know, I think this is an area that a lot of you are uh, aware of, but I did want to describe the impacts of pregnancy related disorders on a women's future cardiovascular health and really have some very basic clinical questions that that we can all ask our patients when we're seeing them in our different areas within cardiology and cardiac sciences. I also want to talk a little bit about understanding the mechanisms that link these pre link these pregnancy complications to future cardiovascular health. For the most part, I'm going to be talking about the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, or I may just call it preeclampsia for simplicity of pronunciation and, and whatnot. But the reason why I do that is there's a lot more evidence uh, uh, supporting the association between the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and future cardiovascular health, but really getting at what are some of the research questions for the researchers in the crowd today. I also then want to talk about simple postpartum clinical management strategies that can improve a woman's future cardiovascular health, but really take that from a health systems question, uh, health systems perspective for the questions for that. You know, I think that we're all very um, aware of the under report by heart and stroke. And, you know, that really hit home in a lot of ways in the women of, in working in the women's cardiovascular space, that women were under researched, under recognized, et cetera. But I want you to try to frame that into how can the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy contribute to that? Is that what's leading to their under survival, uh, different treatments, et cetera? But I also do add another under on that, that it's under prevented. I, I really think in women that we're missing our opportunity to prevent preeclamp, prevent heart disease, in women who clearly have pregnancy related cardiovascular risk factors that put them at the risk. And I'm gonna show you through some of the work that we end up following fewer than 10% of these women. And that's something that really needs to change. But I want to say that things are changing. So in 2018, there was a flurry of observational epidemiologic studies that came out, and it really hit mainstream media in some ways. So first of all, within the same two, within the same week, about two a day apart, JAMA came out with an entire uh, uh, entire. Uh, edition that was focused on women's cardiovascular health and really talking about this window of opportunity we have during pregnancy. 
And on the same day, or, or I think it was the day before, Chatelaine came out with a very powerful article that was directed towards women with lived experience to empower them and to educate them on their future health risk. And I think of all my publications that this one may be the most powerful in terms of its impact of getting right to our target patient population. And we had a lot of inquiries after this came out. But I do want to talk a bit about a clinical example of a clinical patient. And we're really fortunate um, to have uh, this patient as part of our advisory team. I've learned a lot from her and she's given me permission to share her story, which I think is very, very um, fortunate for us today. Um, but I also want to acknowledge here, uh, and, and she is actually on today's call. Um, and so if, if anyone um, you know, does have questions for her on the end, we could maybe put her on the spot or not. But, but you know, we, we do always frame things around the patient. And one of the things that when we talk about women's heart health, we often use this word atypical, atypical chest pain, atypical presentation instead of female specific presentation. And this documentary, we really had a, you know, we had a really fortunate chance to, to partner partner with them. So we partnered with uh, Christina D'Alessandro, who is a paramedic from Toronto, who came, who had an observation as a paramedic that women who were having acute myocardial infarction, they were different than the men, and they were really only trained on how to recognize it in men. And so she actually worked with two filmmakers from, from Fort McMurray, Chris and Laura Beauchamp, to put together this documentary called A Typical Heart. And I really encourage everyone to watch it. It's only 22 minutes, but it is quite powerful. But I want to point out three women across here who are all Calgarians. And so we have Cynthia Colhane here, uh, Heather Evans, and Christina Stewie, who all are really powerful women with lived experience who really help guide our research. It was, it was Christina here who said, you know, how can women bring up the conversations with their healthcare providers? And that's what led the Libin team to looking at conversation guides for how can we improve their health. But when you do watch this documentary, you're going to observe that the majority of these women actually did have a pregnancy complication, did not receive follow up after their uh, pregnancy, and went on over years to develop these different symptoms that took a long time to attribute to cardiovascular disease. So that was just a moment there I wanted to spend on this. If we go back to our clinic patient, she has a very long, complicated cardiac history. Uh, starting way back in 2016, uh, very symptomatic atrial flutter that required an ablation in 2018 and resolved. Since then, however, she continues to have left-sided pectoral chest pain. Numerous investigations for that, and it was labeled as being non-cardiac described as a stitch of pain in the left side that laid, goes up to the clavicle and down the left arm, brought on by emotional stress and exercise. But this was actually a very significant symptom that caused her to go to the emergency department multiple times, reassured in the emergency department, no investigations, but you know, heavy use of the emergency department, which could potentially be avoided. She's had numerous investigations over the years, and again, a pattern of often normal investigations. A normal transthoracic echo, a treadmill in 2017 brought on the stitch, but no associated ECG changes, which was reassuring. CT of coronaries, a strong reaction to a beta blocker, and at the time we saw her, she was on no cardiac medications. In terms of her traditional atherosclerotic risk factors, LDL over the years hovered between 2.9 to about 4.28, not requiring treatment. Again, these borderline dyslipidemias that went that go untreated, and CRP less than one, Carlos, just for you. Uh, but bl blood pressures are borderline, and it's hard to know what to make of the blood pressures. And we find this a lot with blood pressure, and I'm going to talk about this later in the presentation. At home, her blood pressure is sort of in the 130s, over 90s. When she goes to the emergency department, blood pressures are quite quite high there on presentation 190 over 102, but in clinic, our BP true gets 115 over 77. So again, you know, how do you manage this blood pressure? Often being labeled as borderline, she's young, 44, let's let this go. Hemoglobin A1C is in the dysglycemia range or pre-diabetes at 6.1. BMI is around 31, ALTs is in the 50s and 60s, suspecting here of all the metabolic syndrome that we have going on, and lifestyle, non-smoker, but no real physical activity. And you know what, I think if a lot of times in clinic, we leave it there, but this was really interesting to me. She talked about a lot of stress and was really willing to share with me what this was like, because we really want to get at how can we prioritize your lifestyle? And when we talk about the gender roles, this is where it really comes out. She has 
three amazing children with very different educational and advanced health needs. And so as we see a pattern here, women are able to put their family's needs and address those, but often none don't prioritize their own and are too exhausted at the end of the day to participate in activity, et cetera. Family history of cardiac events. In terms of our pregnancy risk factors, in her first pregnancy, and uh, so she's about 13, 14 years postpartum at this point, but delivered at 36 weeks from health syndrome. Uh, baby was six girl, six pounds, 12 ounces. Second pregnancy was at term. Uh, so remember term is 40 weeks essentially, or anything greater than 37 to 40 weeks is term. Below 37 weeks is preterm. But she did have a postpartum hemorrhage, which we're now recognizing again as a cardiovascular risk indicator. In the third pregnancy, um, she went to term again, but the placenta was calcified and platelets were dropping. So again, we starting to get early help syndrome there, but being delivered. So I would ask a question and get people to vote as to what is your next step? You know, um, should we do another stress test or maybe a different type of stress imaging, angiogram, just do lifestyle counseling and reassurance, start pharmacotherapy, nitroglycerin, or put in a CHAMP referral to Dr. Raj uh, from psychiatry. And we ended up doing a combination of many of these, many of these, to which we were, she was very successful. She did see Dr. Anderson from uh, cardiology about the question of could this be microvascular disease, and it, through doing a combination of these uh, uh, interventions, as well as an individual exercise plan, she was able to actually slowly titrate up her exercise. Uh, exercise and then slowly titrate down without any cardiac symptoms or worry that goes with it and has been very successful at uh, maintaining and losing weight, which has been fabulous. I will shift next to a bit about the preeclampsia and the clinical manifestations. I think a lot of us have, you know, been out of practice for many years and we think about these women with preeclampsia with very high blood pressure, you know, they might seize, they get swollen and puffy. And if we get to the placenta, we're feeling pretty lucky that we remember that preeclampsia comes from placenta and just poor placentation. But I do want to just dive into this a little bit for, uh, for the clinicians in the room here, because we now know that this placenta is far more active than we thought. So I think in medical training, we just knew that there was poor implantation, the two circulations, maternal and placental, didn't implant properly, the arteries didn't get deep enough, and resulted in the maternal and fetal syndromes that we saw. However, we now know that there's a fair amount of placental dysfunction. We still haven't solved this part here, Carlos, as to what causes preeclampsia, but we do know that the placenta doesn't implant. And it produces a whole bunch of different mediators, and I'm just going to call them biomarkers because that's a lot of the language right now that we're using. These are still under study in various different combinations and ratios and levels, but at the end of the day, these are what go around and actually damage mom's blood vessels from head to toe and cause the clinical syndromes that we see. So we start with the abnormal placentation and end up with the maternal uh, endothelial dysfunction that results from, um, uh, from this process, uh, uh, the women get impaired endothelial function. But we now know, we used to teach that preeclampsia went away as soon as you delivered the placenta. But we now know that this endothelial dysfunction that's occurred from head to toe is, per, is, is long lasting, that it doesn't resolve quickly. Uh, and how long does it persist? We're not really sure. But that's the thing I wanna to incorporate today is that this is not going away for the majority of our women. Now, there was a landmark study in 2005. And so again, uh, media is getting a, hang, a hold of this in 2018, and we have a 13 year lag between when this big landmark trial came out, and this is Ontario data, that looked at over a million deliveries and actually really found uh, a few important factors here. So they found that maternal placental syndromes or preeclampsia, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, were very common. They occurred in 7% of all deliveries. And it's probably even higher than that because we often don't recognize it as clinicians. And so if we don't code it in our charts, it, you know, it, it didn't happen. But what they found is that there was a signal for card increased cardiovascular disease across any vascular territory. So about a doubling of cardiovascular risk uh, from brain, heart, and peripheral arterial disease as well. They also found that this occurred by any type of severity of, of hypertensive disorder pregnancy. So we talk about gestational hypertension where it's just high blood pressure, preeclampsia where you start to get maternal end organ involvement. And then the severity is if that baby doesn't grow well or growth restriction 
or then uh, to fetal death, which we do see from time to time. And some of our patient advisors have had that situation. So hazard ratios start increasing again in a dose response relationship. And up here where we have adverse fetal outcomes, that's where we're getting risk estimates that are higher than type two diabetes or type one diabetes as a cardiovascular equivalent after 10 years. But what was also really powerful about this study, again, they only followed out for 14 years at this point, is that they actually found that the average age in this cohort, the median age of onset of a vascular event, hospitalized for a vascular event, stroke, TIA, heart attack, was 38 years old. So we have a really young population that's starting to have uh, established cardiovascular events. Now, Joel's group, Joel's group from Toronto, Dr. Joel Ray, he followed these women out now 24 years using ICES data. And what these now shown is that as you follow these women out, the risk of premature cardiovascular disease starts to come very close to that of men. And so when they looked at it in terms of the incidence rates, you know, thinking all the time that women, uh, you know, have fewer infarcts than men, they actually found here that men had an incident rates of premature cardiovascular disease of 22.5 for 10,000 person years. And women with preterm preeclampsia before 37 weeks actually had very similar incidence rates here again. So this is you know, a sex specific risk factor that's now approximating um, male risk of premature heart disease. But for the cardiologists as well, it's not just atherosclerotic disease that these women are experiencing. We now know not just from Dr. Joel Ray's study called had mps of looking at arrhythmias as well and heart failure. But a lot of groups across the world are looking at heart failure emissions in that first four years after delivery and actually finding very high rates of admission within four years. And this is the area that we focus on is predominantly this first four years when we're starting to see signals of cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk factors. I do want to touch on mortality because mortality is something you know, clearly important, also difficult to measure. And there's been more studies that have come out, but this one is a bit of a powerful graphic. It may be an overestimation of death, but what we saw here from the US when they looked at uh, women who'd had a hypertensive disorder pregnancy, found here that women who'd had preeclampsia had a two times higher risk of premature cardiovascular death. But women who had early onset, and this time they divide, defined as less than 34 weeks, actually had about a 10 times higher risk of cardiovascular death. But for me, it's these numbers here, their survival at 56 years old. So taking these women 30 years after delivery, they're still very young. They're in their 50s, early 60s, you know, still working, still productive members of our society, that women, again, who had early onset preeclampsia, fewer alive at 30 years. So we have 86% alive at 30 years. So these slides have been very powerful, showing us that women with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are infarcting as early as their 30s and dying in their 50s. And we really need to get strategies to care for these women. So if I summarize, again, flurry of epidemiology, but if I summarize all the future risks associated with the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, We'll see here that women have an increased risk of developing hypertension, uh, coronary heart disease, stroke, atrial arrhythmias, heart failure, cardiovascular death, all cause death, and then a lot of other disorders relating again to vascular dysfunction. So increased kidney disease, depending on the number of pregnancies. We found increased risk of seizure disorders, again, thought to be due to the uh, vascular turn in the brain premature dementia, um, other neurological findings on MRI, visual, mental health though, not just in the short term, but increased risk of future mental health disorders, anxiety, depression as well. And again, not great programs to follow this up. Higher rates of type two diabetes and dyslipidemia too. So if we summarize all the reproductive risk factors, again, I've used the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy because they are the most common and also there's the most evidence supporting. But just to give you a sense as to why we need to ask about pregnancy, it occurs, these complications or reproductive risk factors occur in at least 10 to 15% of pregnancies and probably closer to 20%. So they identify one in five women. 
when we look at the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, again, a dose response relationship where we have women with the most severe forms, when we meta, when Sarah McDonald meta analyzes these, odds ratios here has a ratio of greater than four, four times higher risk of, of atherosclerotic events. Gestational diabetes around two times higher risk. However, most of this epidemiologically is mediated through the development of type two diabetes. And most of these will control for the development of cardiovascular risk factors. Preterm birth, we're starting to see large signals here coming out about odds ratios consistently of 1.5 for premature cardiovascular disease, premature ovarian failure, and infertility. And that's an area that is quite new. Lower odds ratios again, but showing us throughout this whole reproductive pathway that there are um, signals that we as clinicians can act upon. An article just came out last month showing postpartum hemorrhage of women who needed a transfusion, 1.5 times higher risk of heart disease. Again, that placenta is not normal. Um, it doesn't uh, come out uh, this, the same way. And you know, can this be what's creating the endothelial dysfunction for mom from head to toe? So I hope I've convinced you throughout this that it's important that clinically that we start to ask about um, reproductive history. But how do you do that, especially as a cardiologist? And one of the things in working with Obesity Canada that I've learned is the five A's of obesity, where you ask permission at first, because this can be a little bit difficult for some women to talk about. And so I think a simple way to do that is using the five A's of ask. Uh, ask a question like this. We now know that pregnancy can affect your future heart health. Is it okay if I ask you a few questions about your reproductive health? And most women will say yes, and most women will just volunteer all this information without asking. But if they don't, simple questions. We don't need to do that whole obstetrical history of G2, P2, A, this, L. You know, we don't need to know that at this point in outpatient medicine. But a sense as to how many pregnancies did you have? Did you have any complications like high blood pressure, which is often called toxemia, or diabetes with any of these pregnancies? How much did your babies weigh? We're trying to get a sense here as are babies small or growth restricted, less than 2,500 grams, or are babies big, greater than 4,000 grams or eight pounds, 13 ounces? And, and women will generally remember, you know, small babies or big babies. The ones in between, they might not remember their birth weights. A really important question is, were they born prematurely, less than 37 weeks? Or you could ask, did they need NICU care? And did you need any fertility treatments? So these are giving us that signal as to what kind of conditions they might have had um, and, and how does this change their cardiovascular risk? And I'm gonna show you a risk tool that just came out that does incorporate many of these features. So again, I encourage you, it's a little bit awkward as a cardiologist to start asking these questions, but framing it as, Pregnancy actually has been associated with future health. Can you tell me a bit about your pregnancies? Is that okay? And getting that information actually helps build our pretest probability of, of the probability of cardiovascular disease. So let's just switch here now. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the research questions that come along uh, in this field. And a big one that I often get asked is what's the mechanism? What's the actual mechanism linking cardiovascular disease to pregnancy? And again, we will use the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And this information is not just basic science. We also need population health level data to research this as well. But one of the most common theories is that pregnancy is just a stress test, that pregnancy is unmasking uh, women who were predisposed to go on to develop gestational diabetes, hypertension down the road, or cardiovascular disease. And so that pregnancy sets this threshold, we call it a cardiometabolic threshold for these disorders, and that each pregnancy in a woman who's kind of predisposed genetically, whatnot, uh, just unmasks it during pregnancy, resolves, etc. But we do know that these women can be on the trajectory. There is another graph of this showing that if we modify it, we can change this trajectory here. There's a lot of data epidemiologically that supports this, is that you know, maybe pregnancy is unmasking stress risk factors, or there's the shared risk factors before and during pregnancy. However, there's a second theory uh, that is that it's the direct effects of those biomarkers or mediators or proteins that are released by the placenta that actually either initiate or accelerate the atherosclerotic process in women who've had uh, hypertensive disorder pregnancy. And then the third school of thought is basically a combination of the two. 
So when we're thinking about the preconception shared risk factors of a woman who's at risk of preeclampsia, it tends to be a woman, there's two phenotypes. The one phenotype that we can predict is a woman who has features of metabolic syndrome. So uh, maybe obese going in, borderline brush, blood pressures or chronic hypertension, dyslipidemia, et cetera, who might've needed uh, 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 fertility treatments um, as well as uh, obesity. And those women we actually can identify through risk prediction modeling and actually put them on aspirin that lowers their risk of preeclampsia by about 40%. Is the other phenotype that have two placental dysfunction that we are not as good at recognizing clinically because they tend to have a thin BMI and we may not recognize them early on without ultrasound testing to look at their Doppler flows of their uh, of, um, on ultrasound and miss our window of opportunity for aspirin to prevent Event. But we do know that postpartum, early postpartum, women are starting to just accumulate cardiovascular risk factors. A Canadian cohort study called PENET found that by one year after delivery, women who did not have metabolic syndrome going into pregnancy, that about 20% uh, already met criteria for metabolic syndrome by one year. And by two years, about 22, 23% were meeting criteria for metabolic syndrome, sorry, at three years. So starting early after pregnancy, not losing that baby weight, gaining five kilos at one year instead of losing their baby weight and starting on that pathway for metabolic syndrome. We also know that if you follow these women long enough, uh, this is a very old study, but a bit powerful in terms of the representation here, that if we follow women up to 20 years after delivery, about 100% of women with preeclampsia will go on to develop um, high blood pressure or chronic hypertension. Um, who is more at risk? The Nurses Health Study has showed us that women who were obese or developed obesity actually are in this curve here that have the higher risk of developing hypertension over time. So if we want to focus our efforts, we may want to look at women who already have obesity or have a larger number of uh, modifiable uh, health behaviors to focus on. We also know the early, the late, uh, we also know that the number of pregnancies as well affects this risk. We also know that these women are on their track way to developing type 2 diabetes. And this, again, is Canadian data coming from Ontario that used the ICS, ICES data and actually found here that of women who had the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, about a doubling of the risk of preeclampsia of cardio of type 2 diabetes, sorry. And we know that these even go hand in hand in pregnancy and our group showed as well a, a, an association even earlier during pregnancy. But if women have a couple of these risk factors together, they're at a much, much higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes if we follow them over time. And again, out here, these women are only 30, 40, early 40s, late 40s, 50 years old. So a lot of time that we have to intervene to prevent this. Shifting gears here to the second theory, which was that the, it's the vascular dysfunction that occurs in the setting of preeclampsia. We, we now have a lot of data that supports that there is vascular dysfunction that occurs and that it's potentially not going away. And so a woman comes in with her you know, normal uh, uh, blood vessels, gets a hit during pregnancy uh, due to what we talked about and actually has persistent vascular dysfunction after she delivers. And we do know that regardless of which measure of arterial vascular health that you look at, it's abnormal in women who've had preeclampsia. And, and, and it's probably even earlier, earlier during pregnancy. Uh, I saw Malada was on and Chuan Wen did some work on this and predicting preeclampsia. Stella Daskalopoulou's work at McGill has also been looking at this. But after pregnancy, we know it's not resolving. So higher aortic stiffness, thicker arteries as well, and poor endothelial dysfunction. Many of these studies now have gone after 10 years, and this still continues to persist. persist. But what we don't know is that, you know, we don't see a lot of women preconception. So we assume that they're coming in with a normal baseline here, but maybe some of them, potentially that group that already has the metabolic syndrome is actually coming in with abnormal vascular function at baseline, which impairs the placentation and then leads to what we see clinically afterwards. But we're getting more and more now epidemiologic data that's supporting these, you know, um, 
these vascular measures as well. So we now know from a flurry of studies that have come out of looking at the women who were allowed to have expectant management. So that means that when they were premature and that the um, uh, they wanted baby to kind of grow a little bit longer and get fetal lung maturity and have better outcomes. But the longer that women had for a duration of, of cooking or expectation or expectant management, that now that we're seeing higher increase of cardiovascular disease too, and giving us that theory of it's this dose response relationship with these biomarkers. Similarly, it started out in the kidney literature, and now we see it here in cardiovascular disease, the higher number of pregnancies with preeclampsia or recurrent preeclampsia, um, more cardiovascular disease. And that's a group we can focus on because we can prevent preeclampsia in about 40% of these women. We also know, again, by the severity of, of, of preeclampsia too. So we're getting more and more information that's showing us that this vascular dysfunction that could actually be only what's related to um, the pregnancy itself. Now, again, we talk about this combination of both, and it is likely both, that for a lot of women, they have risk factors, atherosclerotic risk factors, they become recognized during pregnancy, or they go on to develop. But what the, the Dutch did, so the Dutch are absolutely international leaders in this area, is through mathematical modeling, they tried to prove this by showing that even if you absolutely uh, corrected each cardiovascular risk factor, high blood pressure, diabetes, lipids, you still don't account for all the cardiovascular risk. And so they're attributing about 10% of the risk to um, the, the endothelial dysfunction that happens in pregnancy. So now we're going to shift a little bit from you know, what's causing it to what do we do about this? And I, I think as clinicians, we're really poised in this area to actually do something about this. We know that these women are on the trajectory for adverse outcomes if we don't do anything. Their next pregnancy, high risk of preeclampsia, and then future cardiovascular disease. But we've got this opportunity to intervene here. The question now is how? How do we intervene to change this trajectory to get women healthier and have healthier pregnancies and families. And so as a group nationally, we're working on this. We're, you know, it's a new area and we're working on what is the best practice? How can we, until we create the evidence as clinicians and researchers, how can we actually best treat women? And so we're looking at a statement that will be coming out in the new year of all the cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, dysglycemia, dyslipidemia, uh, kidney involvement, and smoking but as well as the other comorbidities of obesity and mental health, because it's a big barrier to our treatment. We really want to be able to tell you who to screen the target population, when to screen them, optimal timing, and how to screen with the most accurate test. But we don't have that data yet. Um, our evidence review has shown us we have very, very little data there, and I'll, I'll highlight some of the key data that we do have. We also don't have data on the treatment. What is the threshold of, inf of initiation for pharmacotherapy and what are our treatment targets? And I urge all of you who are working in the larger cardiovascular trials to start collecting that data on women's uh, pregnancy outcomes so that we can actually have more sex specific information in this regard. So throughout our review, we are trying to harmonize with Canadian guidelines. Uh, we are following a very rigorous evidence review and grading structure as well. So we're part weight, we're uh, over at this part of our best practice statement where we have a national panel of, of experts in the field, and many of you will be involved in stage four, the validation uh, of the best practice statement before publication in the new year. So look for that coming out. So we're going to start with some of the risk factors. How do we screen these risk factors? And I want to show you this article here that looks at one year after preeclampsia. So they took women who already uh, who were seen in clinic and they did an office measurement. Now, one of the issues is, is that they just did an oscillometric measurement. And in Canada, we recommend the automated office. But you know what? They did a blood pressure. So I'm happy with any blood pressure. They took then women, all women went on to get ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And you can see here that that was really important to properly classify about 30% of these women again. So here we have women that you're not sure if they actually, they come in, the blood pressure's high, you wanna call it white coat, 
let's send them for 24 hour blood pressure monitoring to confirm it or have them do some repeated home measurements so that we can actually properly classify and properly treat the blood pressure. Easy peasy, blood pressure measurements, we can all do it and let's do it right and let's get the 24 hour blood pressure measurement when we're not sure. And so in terms of Hypertension Canada, where do we classify these women in terms of their risk of thresholds of for initiation? And they fall into this all other category. So they not sprint type patients for the high risk category. So we have them here under the all other where we would initiate pharmacotherapy with average blood pressures greater than 140 over 90. And we would also treat to less than 140 over 90. Um, I tend to go a little bit lower than that, but as long as we have them less than 140 over 90, I'm happy. Again, we don't have the evidence, but because these women have a long duration of hypertension, I do try to treat them a little bit lower. I'm not sure if Dr. Todd Anderson is able to make today's call, but he was um, very um, um, helpful in getting us, allowing us to integrate hypertensive disorders of pregnancy into the 2016 uh, lipid guidelines so that we start getting that messaging to family, uh, to care providers about just checking for the lipids. Now, we didn't know what to do with them. And so we sort of followed the algorithm here where then these women would have a Framingham risk score or the cardiovascular life expectancy model. And depending on where they classify their low, intermediate or high, you would initiate stat, um, lifestyle intervention, behavioral health modifications first, followed by pharmacotherapy. So what we thought was a reasonable choice was a statin of greater than five based upon the evidence that's out there and other guidelines. Uh, statin indication would be starting it if, you're, if your LDL is greater than 5 or intermediate risk with an LDL greater than 3.5. I am going to come back to this and say that all these tools are underestimating risk in our patient population, but this is a starting point and what we need is a starting point. Chuan Wen, who, who finished her PhD with, with um, Todd and myself uh, and her team here um, did just some really incredible work looking at what's going on in the Calgary area uh, with women who'd had hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and found that when she looked at screening of lipids after pregnancy, found some really interesting results. Some of it is still being published. I think that's in my, my court here to finish off, but sorry, Chuan. But uh, what she actually found is that you know, we're probably screening the wrong women for dyslipidemia. We are screening young women, 41% of women had a, uh, a lipid panel, sorry, um, about 50% of women are getting their cholesterol checked in the first four years postpartum and potentially we're checking the wrong women. But again, we see a dose response relationship here of LDL levels by severity of preeclampsia. Um, again, she represented this visually, any type of lipid, total cholesterol, LDL, and triglycerides, they have a more atherogenic risk, risk profile if they've had a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. And she's got some great data on whether these women were treated appropriately or to target. She also looked at what's their rate of accumulating a dysglycemia or diabetes or prediabetes. And again here, she saw about a doubling of the risk of, uh, of um, dysglycemia over time. And when we look at the test for that, and again, first four years after delivery, a lot of women are getting a glycemic test. So over 60% or 70% of women are getting some form of glycemic test. It tends to be a little bit of the fasting glucose, which may or may not actually be as accurate in these women, particularly if they have PCOS. Uh, um, a few random glucoses here, which again, not helpful clinically if we're looking for diabetes. Now, there may have been other reasons that these were done, but the hemoglobin A1C here is, is uh, uh, again, commonly used in about 30% to 50% of women. And again, showing a dose response relationship of the worse the preeclamp uh, hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, we're seeing an ongoing increase in their uh, A1C levels. Now, putting it all together as to should we be screening the, these women? My answer is yes, but now we have evidence to show that. And this comes from the Netherlands, again, the world leaders in this area. And they actually followed women forward over time. Uh, this is through the PREVEN study, which was focused a bit more on kidney disease. But when they looked at women with preeclampsia, numbers needed to screen their low. So at age 35, the number needed to screen for hypertension is only nine women that you need to screen to detect one case of hypertension that we can treat and modify. 
Dyslipidemia, number needed to screen was higher, 18 women at age 40, and diabetes at 22 women as well. So yes, we absolutely should be screening them, but how do we treat them? And part of it is that all of, in cardiology, there's so much evidence out there that's individualized or risk-based approach. And so if we look at the risk scores in these women, they actually score low. But what you can see here is this is from the PENET cohort out in Ontario, is that if we do the Framingham 10-year risk, they all score below threshold where you would treat them. However, the women are significantly higher than the control. If we look at the 30-year risk, we're starting to see some separation. And if we look at the lifetime risk, uh, again, starting to see some separation in risk. Uh, we have a newer paper that came out looking at the cardiovascular life expectancy model, again, showing a nice differentiation. So recognizing that any of these tools are still likely going to misclassify women. So how can we do better? How can we use this pregnancy history that I've asked you to collect to actually better identify who we should be screening? Well, the McGill group just published this a couple months ago. And they actually looked at how can we take all these maternal clinical variables and so when we have them in hospital, before we lose them to follow up care, can we identify who's at risk of premature cardiovascular disease? And this was looking up to 10 years after delivery. And unfortunately, their risk prediction algorithm isn't um, as accurate as they had hoped, but it's a starting point that we can work from to develop better sex prediction tools. But what was alarming about this in Quebec was the high prevalence of admissions to hospitals. So they were looking using administrative data sets to build their models. And again here, very, very high rates of admission to hospital for confirmed vascular events. So they had here uh, 28.7 uh, incidents per 10,000 person years again. So a signal that these are women that, we, that are coming to our hospitals and coming to our clinics. So how do we, as a, at an administration level or a healthcare system level, like how do we support women and get good care for these women to prevent them coming to your clinics in cardiology or cardiac sciences? And this is the challenge. And so at present, we know that fewer than 50, around 50% 50 of all interdisciplinary providers in Canada are aware of these increased risks. However, only 10% of women report ever being told that they're at increased risk. And so to bridge this gap, we have a, a network of 17 postpartum clinics across the country that are trying to bridge that gap between hospital discharge and primary care. And so a lot of them are obstetric interns like me that see these women in the hospital, and we've set up these follow-up clinics to bridge this gap. But what we're finding when we looked at our Edmonton clinic when I worked up there was that of women who actually accepted a referral, only 25% no-show for their first visit. So again, small clinics, but 25% no-show percent, no for first visit. 50% then no-show for their follow-up visits. And that was something that we were really worried about. Why is this happening? Why are they not coming back? But what was actually even more interesting in Kingston is when Dr. Smith's clinic then refers them on to cardiac rehab, we have only about 25% showing up for their consult and about 10% accepting the referral to cardiac rehab. So we're losing these women out the pipeline and how can we keep them in this pipeline for preventative health? And one of the proposed models that we came up with was how can we actually target physicians and how can we target so primary care physicians, but how can we target the women themselves with information to empower them to actually seek out preventative care? But further to that, how can we actually support primary care with evidence-based intervention? Because our national survey showed that over half of clinicians, probably 70%, reported that they don't have the time to counsel or the resources to counsel women on preventative health. So what can we do? And so I just wanna talk a little about, about like the Alberta Advantage, doesn't feel like it right now, but we have this op opportunity to look at systems level approaches. And so it's targeting the KT or knowledge translation, targeting healthcare providers, of disorders of pregnancy for connect care so throughout the province we have a stepwise rollout of care during pregnancy but what we have there is actually a standardized order to ensure that all women receive follow-up care for their blood blood pressure and their cardiovascular health so in our order sets now 
women should be getting some counseling before they leave hospital about this. We also, in working with Dr. Anderson, Dr. Graham and the SCN have been able to actually modify the enhanced lipid reporting that's done on our, on our lab services recs, where we can actually now women, when they check the box of, uh, will actually get a message that women with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy may score low. And so therefore you still need to individualize treatment. We're also working with Alberta Health Services to go right to women. These women are, are health literate, advocates they're, they're they're amazing and so can, why don't we just get them the information so we're working with them alberta health services on how to leverage my chart and my patient portal to send reminders of basic information but also send reminders about how we screen for risk factors and we actually have the opportunity to track this through the apple surveillance system that we created and so um, this was created to really look at not just what's their cardiovascular health during pregnancy and after, but where are women accessing care so we can go to them? Where are they using the health services so that we can piggyback on preventative care? And so uh, Alexa Desjardins did some of these figures for us, but we have all the rich Alberta data sets out there uh, that we've combined together to give us a really enhanced virtual cohort of their pregnancy health and their child, but the follow-up to up to 10 years post so that we can go to them because they're not coming to us and I wouldn't either. So we need to go to them. But what was a bit shocking, we just have this cohort all linked, is that and our preliminary analyses actually have shown that the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy have actually increased by 25% over 10 years. And, and, and that's this line up here. And, and this is quite worrisome, you know, partly explained by population growth and risk factors, but it's concerning because we actually have evidence to decrease this. Dr. Joanne Johnson is working very hard to develop algorithms where every woman gets screening and um, aspirin. So it is worrisome that we have more burden of cardiovascular disease coming our way. So again, I just want to go back to this concept of we're losing women out this pipeline. We're losing up to 75% of women. And those are women who are actually connected. So we're really reaching very few women. And how do we support primary care? Well, it hit me one day when we were talking about this is that women, they tell us, so informally they tell us they're not coming back to clinic because first of all, it maybe doesn't feel very high yield, but also that it's really difficult for them to prioritize themselves first. And this is when this hit me that this is a gender behavior and a gender barrier to care. And how can we address that? So we have a postpartum clinic in Calgary. It's called Improve Clinic. And it's, it's you know, uh, cardiovascular risk assessment and counseling that we try to individualize where we use health behaviors as first line therapy and pharmacotherapy as second line, but we navigate women to existing AHS resources to try to reduce some of those gender barriers to care. And we talk about how to prevent the next pregnancy. So this is one of our health coaches, Elizabeth, and one of our patients here who her sister, her stepsister actually passed away from HELP syndrome. Uh, her, her sister's name is Kara. Uh, that's why they have a walk every fall for preeclampsia prevention or awareness, uh, and then an app coming out for Kara Cares. Uh, Dr. Ward Fleming is working with the family on that, but very motivated patient. Uh, she did incredibly well with our health coaching program. And so we are collecting data in this, in this clinic to have an enhanced prospective cohort and also piloting this health coaching program where we have health coaches and they actually help women set individualized care, direct them to existing community resources. And what we've seen in our non-randomized pilot in Ottawa is a 44% reduction in lifetime cardiovascular risk at 12 months, and also a reduction of weight of five kilos at, at 12 months, which is huge because these women are generally gaining five kilos. But what really comes out of this is the gratefulness of patients of saying, you know, they allow me to put my health first because this is easy to forget when you're dealing with a newborn. And this has led me to really think is, is health coaching gender transformative? Like, are we actually meeting criteria that the CIHR and WHO have initiated? And when Alexa helped us lay out this figure here, we incorporated with Dr. Leanne Tompfors help, the socio-ecological model of health behavior change, where we have the individual, their family and their social supports, healthcare systems, and the community programs. When we layered in a gender transformative framework that Dr. Peterson out in Vancouver created with her permission, we actually could see here that when we layered out all the interventions that health navigation may be what's breaking down barriers for women, their gender related barriers to health. 
So in summary, we know that pregnancy has strong epidemiologic risks of multiple pregnancy complications. Again, I focused on preeclampsia, but the same for many conditions. Obesity does markedly increase these risks. We need to start asking a pregnancy history of how many pregnancies did you have, any complications, the baby size, if they were premature, and fertility treatments. Again, I'm not even gonna get into contraception or menopausal therapy. We have limitations on our current data. We don't know, uh, we don't have sex specific risk prediction tools. We don't have data yet on optimal thresholds and timing of screening, but we're collecting it and we're getting there. So in the meantime though, we do still need to screen women for cardiovascular risk factors, treat them first line with, pharmaco with lifestyle, but again, considering their gender roles and how can we support that. Second line therapy of pharmacotherapy, but we also need to, as clinicians and scientists, think about how are sex specific biological factors affecting drug metabolism. And I think Dr. Ed O'Brien's lab is really working hard on that from a lipid perspective. This really summarizes it nicely, is stepping to success by the American Heart Association. We need to number one, screen for sex specific risk factors, including pregnancy. If we identify them, we need to assess for traditional atherosclerotic risk factors and screen and prevent intermediate phenotypes and begin aggressive lifestyle modification. And that just doesn't mean saying, okay, you need to exercise and eat better. We all do, right? We need to support this for our patients. And then we actually need to consider their risk estimates and probably increase that risk and treat early and aggressively their risk factors. So with that, again, I'll acknowledge the, the work of our team, particularly women with the lived experience who have really helped shape some of our research questions and studies, our clinical team of health coaches and men support. We have a phenomenal research team uh, locally here at Libin, but also coast to coast through the Canadian Post-Pregnancy Network. And we'll have some exciting work coming out in the new year for that. And again, with the Alberta Health Services or SCNs that have allowed us to do some of this provincial work um, and the Center for Health Informatics in Libin. So with that, I'll take any questions. Oh, and sorry, Wear Red Canada Day is February 13th for Women's Heart Health on February 13th coming up. And with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, thanks, Kara. That was a fantastic, lots of thought-provoking things in a stellar way to close our academic year. I don't see any questions here, but I got a bunch. So you did mention a couple of things about, you know, the placenta and placental dysfunction. Is there any way of, uh, you know, imaging the placenta early on and uh, making an early diagnosis and then kind of giving maybe aspirin to these people? Uh, you know, this sounds like this is a endothelial dysfunction kind of driven disease. So uh, the other question I have is, you know, is a poly pill maybe with uh, aspirin, colchicin, and this LGT2 inhib inhibitor take care of all these problems? Yeah, so, okay, so I love both questions. So the, the placental imaging is, is absolutely right on. Like if we can predict this in pregnancy, we can. So um, there, there's there been a, a group in Europe that identified a risk prediction tool for preeclampsia that is probably the best one we have right now. Uh, you know, certainly there's groups in Canada working on other ones, but it does include imaging, not just the placenta, but like the, 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 uh, uterine artery dopplers and looking at that actually is quite predictive and, and I know Chuan's work looked at that as well uh, in terms of predicting preeclampsia so so within that scoring tool yes if women score high they should be rend they should be given aspirin and in that study they gave 162 sorry 150 milligrams of aspirin at bedtime and it reduced preeclampsia by about 40 percent so Dr. Joanne Johnson's team uh, from MFM is working on that having that uh, a standardized protocol where women come in for their first trimester screen, get that uh, algorithm completed, and then uh, are suggested to take aspirin. So yeah, it, there is a lot of work on that. Uh, Stella Daskalopoulou's lab is looking on adding other pulse wave velocity measurements to that as well. So not just looking at the placenta, but can we get mom's arterial health as well? And does that better predict? Your, your next question about the poly pill, I love that question. And, and, and that's the study I want to do. So we should talk about that. But you know, I think it's a, it's a tough study right now, because these women are very young and people are very concerned about, well, if we put them on a pill, can they breastfeed on this pill? What if they conceive on this pill? You know, can they conceive on a statin and ACE inhibitor, colchicine, you know, and, and the nice thing is now, 
we need to do the lifestyle studies to show that they're not really working. Like they, they may lower weight and they may make other changes, but they're not actually changing their vascular stiffness. And, and again, that's where we really want to look at the vascular stiffness with lifestyle. The poly pill is really important and it is feasible now because we, so we need to show that lifestyle doesn't work in order to do the pharmacotherapy studies, but we really need to work on that because we now have a lot of evidence showing that women can conceive on statins. So if they're taking a poly pill, they can conceive on that without birth defects. They can conceive on, a st on an ACE inhibitor. We just have to stop it early as well. And then actually look a bit better at like the precision medicine of how is that changing their vascular function. So yeah, I fully support the poly pill and would love to you know, work with the McMaster group on, you know, even if we could just do a retrospective analysis of you know, how did women who had a pre uh, preeclampsia respond to the poly pill studies you know i think we could get some good data there for sure yeah it's uh, interesting so what's the the best kind of simple clinical test to identify endothelial dysfunction in, in this population you know something that you could you know you're in your office put this little thingy okay here's your endothelial dysfunction number and this is what we're going to do yeah, and, and it's unfortunate, Malata, I think in Chana I'm here, and they might be able to answer that a bit better than I can. But, you know, Carlo, I don't know that any measure is better than the other yet. Like, there was a systematic review that looked at them, and, and they're all abnormal. Any measure that you want to do is, is abnormal, and they're persistently abnormal. So I, I think to answer your question as well, it's also like the change over time that may be important too, is, you know, what do you see clinically in your office? And is in the early period, it may be really high. And then within that first year postpartum, it may come down, but does it normalize? So whatever tool you have at your disposal to assess her vascular health, uh, you know, I would encourage you to use if you have it. I think what we'd like to do is get, you know, get some evidence for a few of these so that we can support clinicians to purchase and train on some of the equipment uh, in, in their um, clinical practice. So let me ask you, so how do we change the cultural stigma of the mother syndrome? Yeah, um, I, I'd love to throw that out to ideas from the group here. You know, I, I think what you're getting at is that mothers don't like they, they prioritize their families above above everything else. Yeah, but also fathers don't recognize that. So it's a double sorted thing. So how do we change that? Yeah, and, and you know, I think that that's really complicated. And I, I, I think that as you talked there about the fathers not recognizing, you know, I, I think certainly as a society, we need to uh, recognize it and support it, you know, males, females, uh, and then the community as well. Um, I don't know if there's anyone, uh, I think that we have to look at a really multi-level approach to that from, you know, the immediate family to the healthcare and, and to the community. I think there are some evidence-based policies that do help with that. So certainly paid childcare has been shown to improve uh, a lot of outcomes. Um, uh, yeah, I'd love to work a bit more on that, but uh, that's my short answer. Yeah. So Todd is asking that, when do you recommend that women get their first lipid panel post-delivery? Yeah, thanks, Todd. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I can't see who's on right now, but you know, that that's a really good question. And I think what Todd might be getting at is that early postpartum, it's really thought that women have a um, that they have high cholesterol postpartum, that that helps with breastfeeding and in order to get lipids in the breast milk to help uh, the baby's growth and neurological development. So we do see in a lot of women that their lipid profiles are high postpartum and there's not a lot of evidence yet that tells us what's normal, what's abnormal. I, I think, you know, from a lipid perspective, more than six months is probably a good starting point, but it also comes down to feasibility and practicality is that if you need to do a lipid profile, you may just need to do it when they're in your office. And, and that often can be around the six month visit mark. After one year, a lot of women have gone back to work and with a busy family, it's hard to do. So I think from a biological perspective, you know, if they've, you know, uh, after six months gives you a reasonable episode uh, estimate. If they're still breastfeeding, you may need to repeat it after one year. Uh, if they're not breastfeeding, then that result is probably quite accurate. But it's the practicality of, you know, how do you, how do you get these women in your office to have that conversation? Okay, well, great. That was a fantastic talk. And, you know, lots of, of stuff that we need to talk about to do some studies here. Right. So uh, thank you again. That was a great